All right. Well, I love to ask this question first and foremost. It's kind of a big one, but um, when and how did you first fall in love with storytelling or rather have that aha moment where you're like, oh my gosh, this powerful tool can create empathy. It can educate, it can reach people, it can bring people together. <sighs> I guess, I mean, when I was young, you know, four or five years old, I guess it just started from n my sister and I, you know, putting on little plays for the rest of the family and um, whether it was a retelling of Cinderella or <laughs> something that we'd written. Um, yeah, it was just a way to get everyone in the same room. We used to line up all the chairs, get all of the chairs from the house, line them all up, make like a proper little theatre and all eyes would be on us and it would be seven minutes <laughs> where we'd all be in the same room. It would be quiet and we'd be able to say whatever we wanted to say. Um, and it was often nonsense, of course, but I think probably that and also films, you know, watching films from a young age and um I think I was quite a sensitive kid in the in the sense that I would sometimes watch a movie and if it upset me it would stay with me for a really long time. It would yeah. take days to to shake it off. Um like I remember watching Watership Down for the first time with my sister again and I mean, she is still horrified by that, but like she can't even talk about it <laughs> because it was so upsetting. Um, and like the horse from The Never Ending Story, oh, you know, okay. sinking in the swamp of sadness. Mm -hmm. I, it took me a while to get over that. I'm still like that too. I watch a movie now and if, if it's something that moves me or shakes me, it, it can take me a really long time to sort of shake it off. Yeah, no, I can totally relate to that. That still happened, but that's sort of, it's so interesting because now that I'm thinking about this, when I was a kid, I was the same way. Like it would sit with me for a long time. And I think, I think that's why I've always been such a vivid dreamer too, because it's like, you know, um, but an overactive imagination. Uh, you also get that thing where you wake up and you've had a vivid dream, had a vivid dream and that takes a while to shake off as well. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it was a dream, but it, it can color your whole day. It can ruin like your whole day, the day yeah. of those around you. Like it totally messes with you. Um, yeah, oh, I relate that's to that so too. true. But I think those, you know, that same vivid imagination is what makes you such a brilliant storyteller. And I think that that's sort of what I now as an adult, even though it is still really like takes a toll on you emotionally, it's what I love about filmmaking and storytelling. I love when it sits with me. I love when I continue to find things and when the story continues to grow in my head and I can have these yeah. conversations. Um, and that to me is a perfect segue into Loki season two, because that's what it did for me. I, I find myself continuing to have these really in-depth conversations about all of the beautiful themes that were explored in the season. Um, so thank you for that gift because oh, that's it's cool. Gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> oh, that's good. No, that's cool. That's great. I think it's there's nothing worse than coming out of the a cinema or or watching something and thinking, meh, meh, meh. <laughs> Where, where's just my where's the stuff that where were the like the lols or the or the tears or something mm -hmm, um, exactly. so that's good that it made you think something <laughs> oh i'm so i mean it, no it continues like i i love having conversations well first of all it's one of the only shows that i can my husband and i like watch together which is like very rare to find like a show that you both love and you're so passionate about and you both have to like press play at the same time so then you yes. can discuss but you know what uh, ours is it's not as cool ours is bake off <gasps> that's really it's sweet, like the though. only thing we watch together religiously and um, it's so english though isn't it what british it's so british bake you off. love it over and here you're like, like obsessed <laughs> really oh yeah yeah okay <laughs> we get love it. It. We're like oh my gosh <laughs> I just, oh, I, I could like go on about Bake Off because I just saw a headline that really upset me. It was like, Bake Off needs a villain. And I was like, no, it doesn't. No, 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 no. The best thing about Bake Off is there's no villain. Everyone's super nice to each other. Very collaborative and supportive. That's It makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside. 100%. There's no place for a villain. 
I, I, I was no like, no building is as close to a villain as we need. No. Yeah. I was like, no, thank you. I don't like really no drama. Like enough, enough. No. But anyways, um, okay, let's dig into it. Okay. Um, to me, a big season, I mean, I'm sorry, a big, <laughs> it's a little early for me. I'm sorry. I have my coffee. <laughs> My little brain. Um, oh, yeah, of course. A big, a big theme of this season to me was love. And you have characters who have been kind of boxed in by their villain labels who haven't been really shown love or are kind of learning for the first time what it means to be loved, what it means to love. Um, now that Sylvie, you know, she's completed her mission, her revenge mission, she's chosen to live out her life alone on an alternative timeline. In your opinion, was her choice an act of self-love or reluctance to let love in? Self-love. Mm. I think at this point, she is is ready to, to do it a bit of that yeah mm -hmm. i think she's been running for so long fighting for so long trying to kill this guy for so long she's finally done it she thinks she's sort of saved the world <laughs> um she's you know given herself and other people free will and i think she's she's ready to just try and live and make some connections and make some friends and try and let some love in. I think it's difficult for her, but yeah. I think that's the new mission at the beginning of series two. And it's beautiful. And to me, like where she kind of chooses to, you know, um, chooses to go feels very quintessentially like human. You have this, you have this person who has all this power and she's decided to kind of live a more, I hate to use this word simple because, you know, it's not that it's simple, but it feels very human. She has this nine to five job. She visits the local record store. You know, she goes to her bar, gets her whiskey. You know, do you think that there's a little bit of her that's kind of, um, is she finding contentment? and the comfort of the simplicity because it's a really good place to start to heal from all the trauma that she's endured and having kind of that stillness. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think you've nailed it. I think she's, she's, she's trying to be normal or what mm. she thinks she's meant to do to be normal. Um, getting the nine to five job, like you say, visiting the record store, making, you know, couple of friends um even if it's the guy behind the bar the guy behind the record store counter um and yeah i think it's a slower pace more simple than where she's just come from for sure and like you say it's um it's a safe space to start to heal to start to just slow down and sample what it's like to live like the majority um of other happy seeming people. Mm -hmm. So she's sort of doing what she thinks she's meant to be doing. Yeah. And she's just trying to fit in. She's, 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 she's taken a stab at trying to be happy. Yeah. And I think too, there's a lot of it of like her for the first time in her life, making choices that are solely her own. And, you know, you have this, you have this woman who, was you know grew up in these war zones and these apocalypses and has been on this mission from as long as she can remember and now it's like what now and now it's i think she's finally figuring out and that's going to take time of like what do i want what do i need what does life look like for me without this chaos um and yeah it was a really beautiful beautiful arc to explore um, but then, you know, Loki comes, comes a calling <laughs> and ruins everything. Yeah. You know, with this big news of, you know, that the TVA is pruning these timelines, essentially killing mil millions and millions of people. And Sylvie's reaction is kind of like, I've done my, I've done my bit. 
Um, and I don't think I think when, when Loki first first arrived, she doesn't quite realize the extremity of what's happening. The, she doesn't she doesn't quite understand how crucial it is that she helps. I think she's all she hears is the TVA needs mm -hmm. your help. And Loki, who they didn't part on the best terms. So she's just like, no, I don't want to hear it. You know, I'm staying here. This is my new life. Leave me alone. Stop trying to mess it up without really hearing him out. Yeah. And then Brad comes along and she, she sees what's happening. And then she knows that actually she could, she, she needs, to, she has to help. She has to help. Because it's, yeah, because it's a threat to everything, every timeline, every person, including herself and her, her new home and all of her new friends. So she realizes that, okay, oh, shit, I have to go back there and help. I think what's so brilliant about this show, too, is that these responses are so human. Even though, you know, you have these supernatural beings, this is such a human response. I think, a, like, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there's a little bit probably of denial, too. Like, to our point that we were just speaking on that she's finally found kind of the safe space that she can start kind of exploring what she wants, exploring herself. And when you're in that, it's really hard to hear any news of any kind. And, you know, there must be, and it's, it's sort of your heart breaks for her almost for a minute because you can understand that on such a human level, um, that feeling of like, you know, well, I don't want to leave. Like I feel I'm, I feeling, I'm feeling safe here. Um, but ultimately she's got to do the right thing. Um, let's talk about two words. Let's, let's get into the finale of it all since we can spoil everything, which is so fun. <laughs> so fun. It's so nice to actually be able to talk about it. Right. I have such a hard time when I do interviews you know, mid season or at the top of the season. And I've had the honor of like watching all episodes, but I have to be like, oh. keep it together. <laughs> That's so hard for you. Yeah. Like I'd be oh messing up all the time. What about the bit where, Oh, what about, Oh, exactly. no, I talk about anything. you want to get in trouble. You want to keep your you job. Fun? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. Well, Let's go back to that, like, kind of universal theme of love in the season. At the end of the, in the finale, Loki sort of makes this ultimate sacrifice out of love, out of love for Sylvie, out of love for the team. Um, you know, how do you think that's changed her perspective seeing that, seeing that sacrifice? Oh, I think she was... Um, I think she has a lot of respect for Loki for, for doing that by the end of series two and for, for giving her and everyone else a chance mm -hmm. um, and knowing that he has to spend eternity now on his own in what well, I imagine is quite an uncomfortable position. Yeah. <laughs> holding, holding all of time together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so true so i think she has a massive amount of respect for him and also is super grateful that he's done that and he's had the had the thought to do that um so she's sort of relieved that they that they have a chance at this by the end and grateful i think because it's sylvie and loki there is also a grain of some thought within her that is going to keep an eye on the situation <laughs> because, because at the end of the day, right, he's, he has his throne and he is doing his God thing on this throne. And historically speaking, that hasn't gone well. Like mm -hmm. the last person in that, in that chair, the person, the last person who was controlling all of time didn't, you know wasn't great so i think sylvie is just a little bit apprehensive about the fact that it's you know free will can never be free will if there's someone in charge of it all and that person you know what if loki sees something on the timeline that he does not like he's going to find it really difficult not to meddle 
or not to intercept something or change something somehow. So, and I think she knows him so well because they are versions of the same being um, that it's it's going to be difficult just to sit back and do nothing. Yeah. If something goes oh. wrong, right? Yeah. Oh, I have chills. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, massive respect, hugely grateful. And also, I'm going to keep my eye on you, buddy. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, <laughs> it's because it's Sylvie and trusting is like the most difficult thing for her to do. For sure. And we get that. And But also, she cares about the guy so deeply. And I think, too, there's there's got to be this. When we, when we care about people so deeply and we love people, we always got to keep an eye out. Um, right. And, um, yeah. Ooh, okay. Um, well, speaking of, you know, your brilliant creator and writer is set to to uh, write the next Avengers movie. So do you think there is, um, would you like to see Sylvie, you know, like be part of a team? Do you think that she's sort of ready for? Who knows? Who knows, Meg? I don't know. Maybe. No, I know you don't know, but it's like, yeah, would you love, would you, do you feel like now that she's, she has had those moments of stillness on her own timeline, do you think that she's ready to kind of collaborate and kind of give herself, give herself to responsibility in a sense? Or do you think she's still got a lot of time to heal? I think Sylvie is a fighter and I think she's always got some unfinished business somewhere yeah. um so yeah I can see her as part of a team or and I feel like she started this whole thing so there is unfinished business for her um she also loves the fight and I think there's something in her that is drawn to chaos because mm -hmm. Loki yeah so um yeah i don't think she's going to be sitting around listening to records working at mcdonald's for long yeah yeah no <laughs> i love that she is drawn to the fight i mean that's why we love her she's got that fire within her um let me ask you a question from an actor's perspective you know when you step into the shoes um, of sylvie you know you're playing a character who is part of this ever-growing expansive universe which is so unique i think for an actor do you prepare differently for a role like that knowing that there may be big ch changes or shifts or just because it's so expansive no uh, not really <laughs> um i think i prepare in the same way i just look at what's happening right now what 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 what's what has been and start just from uh, the character's point of view. I don't worry about all of the big universal stuff because it, I think it can actually get really confusing and um, get you in your head a little bit. Um, so I just start from Sylvie and what's going on for her right now in this moment and the relationships and the other people. Maybe when I'm reading the scripts, I, I have to, I have to understand what's happening mm. with the overall stories. Um, I do that with every script. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure I understand what's happening. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But I think the, <laughs> the, the writing is so brilliant in Loki, though, that I can imagine at the end of the day, again, it's so human. It's so grounded. So is an, um, and, you know, they're, yeah. They're so yeah. Yeah, so we start from that and start from the, the human aspect of it and the the emotion and the acts and the the conversations that are happening and the subtext and the um and I work mainly with my intuition. So, you know, and the way and my instinct and the way I feel Sylvie would be in that moment and what she'd say and how she'd feel. So and I do that with every character. So I guess it's no different in that sense. Yeah. 
I love that. I love that. I think I find it so interesting. I love to ask that question because, you know, everyone's prep is different. Everyone's um, way into a character is different. And um, I can imagine sometimes it's like, you know, from my perspective, seeing these big universes, I'm like, oh, do th- is there like a, you know, get overwhelmed by like all of it. But again, like to your point, it's just the scripts are so good in the series. And it just like the conversations we had so many beautiful you know, nuanced um, dialogue between, you know, you and Tom in the season that it was just just two people having these really kind of existential conversations in a way that felt akin to conversations I would have with loved ones or friends. Like it felt very yeah. relatable um, and um, it was lovely. It was lovely to watch. No, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> that's what we want. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, really quickly before I let you go, thank you so much again. This was lovely. Um, your next project coming up, the Radleys, right? Um, this sounds really yeah. fun. I know we don't know too much about it, but it's about a family of vampires. I'm already like hooked. Um, anything you'd like to share about the filming experience, how that set was? Um, it was fun. It was really hot because it was oh, the really? of summer. So we were all really warm. <laughs> that's the that's the strongest memory I have of the shoot. Um, Damien Lewis, obviously, and um, Kelly McDonald were both brilliant um, and very lovely. So yeah, we, and um, and Eros, the the director, lovely man. So yeah, we just had a nice time in the summer in London. It was here, so it was you know just down the road. I love you. Love that. that Cushy. Yeah. Oh, that would be a dream. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's wonderful to travel the world for work, but at the same time, to be able to just like, uh, oh, yeah. Dream. To be able to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get home within half an hour is, yeah, the dream. Absolutely. Well, Sophia, this was so wonderful. Thank you again for your time and congratulations on everything. You're you're so brilliant. And um, I can't wait to see like, you know, the Radleys and what you do next and next. And I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. So this was such a joy. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.